Okay, well, we've officially learned that this conference has been a great success. And so we need to plan for the next one. Okay. Uh, oh, I need to... Is it... Uh... Well, so the next one, it could be next year, but I think it should be a little bit further in the future. The way this came about is the organizers, as organizers do, approached me with the possibility of running some kind of future of physics discussion. Okay, I said, yes, uh, show somebody I like and respect a lot, I'd do that if you'd like. After thinking about it just a little bit, I realized a really good plan for how to conduct such a discussion. One, most importantly, that would be no work at all for me. <laughs> and secondly, a plan that had actually quite a good chance for predicting fu interesting future trends in, in our field. And that plan was to get up here and then hand Joe the mic and ask him to talk for 45 minutes. <laughs> that plan is still on the table. <laughs> But after thinking about it for a little while, I, and having gone through one of these in the not too distant past, I realized that this time of all times, that would be a little unfair. So, although I think we're going to impose on you in that regard in the not too distant future, don't completely relax. So I think it's our job to handle this future physics discussion. And it really is our job. Normally what I would do is I would choose a panel and invite the panel to give some nice presentations and then have a little discussion afterwards. And that, that probably would have worked fine. But one thing that, that I appreciate a lot about Joe, and I know all of you also do from what you've said, is that Joe is an exceptionally open and interactive physicist. So I thought I would try an experiment and really try to run an open discussion, a real discussion about what physics is going to look like in the future. This is a risk. We'll see how it goes. But if it doesn't work, it's your fault, Joe. <laughs> um, now such a discussion needs a frame. The frame I chose was planning for Joe's 90th birthday. Uh, this 30-year period was kind of interesting. First, it was intended to emphasize to you and to me and to a lot of other people in this room that there was physics past 60, well past 60, 30 years past 60. The second thing is I want to encourage all of you, when you think about what to say, uh, not to think about the paper you've just written or the paper that you've almost finished, but maybe a few more down the line. I realize that's virtually impossible, but try to push yourselves a, a little bit. And finally, um, the 30-year time scale actually was short enough that people in Joe's generation, like me, can remember back that far about what was going on, at least on a good day. Uh, <laughs> this starts happening. So. <laughs> okay. so just to set some context, let me remind you that uh, 30 years ago, almost exactly, the first superstring revolution started. Some of us were around and was, were... Uh, involved in that period. Um, just a few years before that, inflation was proposed. Now, I don't have to tell you that a lot has happened in that 30 years, but some of the questions we were puzzled about and wrestling with then, we're still, we're still puzzled about and wrestling with today. So it's possible to think about what's happening now and have some idea about some things that might be happening 30 years from now. Of course, the art will be to choose those things now that might still be relevant 30 years from now. I didn't systematically collect a set of ideas 30 years old that are boring and stupid and seem silly right now. I'll let you think about that. So your job now is to take a few minutes and think about things that you think will be important, interesting, puzzling, well into the future. Yes, Simeon? Yes. Wait. In honor of Joe's contribution, I want to point out that uh, w the key advance in 
the, the key puzzle in physics over the next 30 years is likely to be what is the identification of the e to the minus 1 over g string effects in the heterotic string? Okay, I'll, I'll thank you for your contribution. <laughs> Okay, so while you're thinking, and I guess Simeon has already done his thinking, uh, I'm going to, just for context, go over some of the things that have happened in the last 30 years. But you're only supposed to pay, pay peripheral attention to what's on the screen, because you're supposed to be thinking. Okay. So the first thing let's talk about are some of Joe's accomplishments in the last 30 years. We've heard a lot about them. They're no less impressive for that. And they really have played a major role in the development of our kind of physics during that time. Remember the exact RG. You've heard about the first D-brain paper with Di and Lee, the second D-brain paper, the work on the string landscape with Rafael Busso, the work on modulized stabilization with Kachru and Gideon. <laughs> I was just about to say that Polchinski Strassler should be in here, and it was my fault for leaving it. It just got a little crowded around this time. <laughs> Next, we come to the ADS integrability work with Vena and Royban. You remember that one? <laughs> and of course, the work on firewalls with Almieri, Don Baralf, who I guess is, couldn't be here, and Jamie Sully. Oh, did Don, did you make it? Oh, great. I'm glad that you could. OK, let, that brings me to another important comment, OK? I could have filled in this timeline virtually densely, okay, <laughs> with accomplishments. I'll let you do that. The idea was to illustrate, really, that there's an enormous amount of work, and it's been a very important benefit to us all. I'm going to make a prediction now. This timeline is not going to stop. We're going to see more blips on this line all the way into the future. Not all the way, but well into the future. <laughs> That's the prediction I'm going to make. The rest of you will have to do a little bit better than that. All right. There are, I could have tried to put together something about more general theoretical developments. I didn't want to touch that with this poll or any other poll. You guys know those theoretical developments as well as I do. You can think about them. I'm not going to talk about them. But it strikes me we should remember some things about experiments. Remember, just before our chosen time period, the W and Z boson discoveries were announced in 1983. That kind of sets the frame over here. The first big blip is this incredible discovery of high TC superconductivity, a huge surprise. I don't think anybody would have predicted that in the previous 30 years. And that surprise and trying to understand it has set the agenda for whole branches of theoretical physics, including ones we've heard about. We should only be so lucky as to have such a surprise. Next came uh, the discovery by the COBE satellite of cosmic microwave background fluctuations, the discovery of the top quark, this amazing surprise, at least to most of us, if Steve Weinberg were here, maybe he wouldn't agree with that, of the non-zero cosmological constant in 1998, and in the same year, the discovery of neutrino oscillations. Then a little later, and this is sort of an average of a bunch of different experiments, the discovery of the peaks in the cosmic microwave background. And then finally, the discovery of the Higgs boson just a couple of years ago. So think about what kinds of things we might look forward to, we might try to achieve. Just as a reference while you're thinking, there's a field that where things have been changing very quickly in the last 30 years, even more quickly than this, I think. And we are consumers of that area. It's the field of information technology. So just to help remind you of what can happen in other areas, here's some high points in the development of, micro, of uh, information technologies. <laughs> Don't spoil my jokes. I may need that hockey stick. I'm not sure. 30 years ago, in 1984, the first Macintosh computer that some of you in our generation at least remember, you'll remember that incredible commercial during the Super Bowl celebrating Orwell's 1984. That was happening then. Okay. Mathematica, there are many sort of precursor languages, but it's a good endpoint. 
the archive, which has changed our lives a lot, started in 1991. World Wide Web was introduced in 1991, although I think it didn't push into our kind of physics until a couple of years later. Google, our current encyclopedia, our other encyclopedia, Wikipedia, Skype, changing our lives, Facebook, which is changing some of your lives, including Joe's, not mine. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Twitter, iPhone, Dropbox, the iPad, and that indis indispensable app, Snapchat. <laughs> Talk to your children, your grandchildren, your nephews, if you don't know what it is. Okay. All right, so that's uh, been your delay. Now we have to get going and, and do our real work. Would you pull up the screen and the, the side? And turn on all, whoops. Other side, this side? No, just bring this up. Oh. And so I was nervous about trying to run this uh, free and open discussion because frankly, my, my view of Joe's friends, all of us in this room for these purposes, is that they're a very shy and retiring bunch. <laughs> even some of the ones in the front row. Uh, and so I was worried that there would just be a stunned silence when I opened this up. So I've asked the organizers if they would help get this started. I guess Don, do you say a few words, and then Eva? And so what I propose to do is just to make some notes about some of the ideas that are mentioned, and we'll try to do some free-form organization of some of the ideas that uh, seem to be important. So you can start whenever you want. Okay. So it's hard, of course, to predict what will happen in 90 years, in, sorry, in 30 years. But I think I at least offer a dichotomy that I think either we're finally going to figure out some kind of good uh, bulk definition of string theory, a, you know, the desired completion of the old string field theory program, something of that kind, or we're still going to be sitting around scratching our heads, arguing about black holes and the information paradox. <laughs> Uh, bulk quantum gravity or uh, lost in black holes. Lo uh, lost in black holes. Okay. Elaborations on this? A new column? Either one? Yes. So, yeah. uh, okay. That's not bulk quantum gravity? That is I'll take that as a friendly amendment. That's fine. OK, well, uh, uh, closer. Or do you want, do you want to, I'll, we, we can have some uh, sort of multicolor editing. Yes? So I would like to offer a middle column there. OK. Actually. I think it's the middle column. No, sorry, more, it's more on the left, actually. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, Steve. I'm so sorry. Maybe okay. it's... So, so, uh, so what, so, say the words and we'll place okay, it. Okay, I'll say the words. So these puzzles about black holes that Don is alluding to yeah. have been largely derived in the language effective field theory showing that you know, uh -huh. that, among other things, can't be preserved. Um, but the arguments are very UV-sensitive. Yes. And the question of when effective field theory breaks down and how is a, is a dynamical question. <laughs> and it's a question that we can begin to ask very concretely in perturbative string theory. This idea that you have to jump to some non-perturbative answer for everything in order to begin to answer that question, I think, is um, not at all clear. And uh, you know, so, so <clears throat> just jumping from particle physics to perturbative string theory calculations of the breakdown of the vacuum, so non-adiabatic effects, already leads to surprises beyond uh, naive particle production calculations, for example. Okay. So, so, um, so I, I, I really don't think it's clear that one needs some completely different framework to, to make progress on the question. I'm not sure. Uh, OK. Um, yes. Okay, I, I, an even more basic one. I think in uh, 30 years we'll either uh, have really good arguments that there is no theory of quantum gravity in four dimensions other than the ones we get from string theory, or we will have, know about alternatives. Uh, so, 
What is quantum gravity? Can I say? Uh, Other alternatives to string theory, which we know is a theory of okay. quantum Okay. Um, I don't think I'm. Are there alternatives to string theory? Now, string theory, in uh, in some very uh, generalized sense, yeah. right? As generalized as we can make it. Yes. Yeah, so just elaborating on the last two uh, and differing a little bit, yes. I think we it pretty clearly uh, seems that we need uh, non-perturbative information to resolve these puzzles with uh, big black holes and their formation and evaporation. Uh, so I, I would differ uh, with Eva on that, I think. Okay, but, uh, but maybe maybe we can suggest that there'll be a discussion like this, that these are things that will be... Uh... Well, we can... Well, there... There's a question of the role of perturbative versus non-perturbative, and I think we already know that non-perturbative is uh, is quite important. So okay, but one thing we don't want to do here is, uh, you know, is is get down, dig down into the weeds of the argument. Sure. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, so, but th the other thing is, uh, you know, how will or will string theory supply us with a full non-perturbative definition of of quantum gravity that gets at all of these issues, and that's been a uh, this, this is part of that, I guess, yeah. or, or can it? Uh, yeah, phrasing it a different way, but yeah. Well, so so there might be a, a beyond, you know a, a super super is the wrong word a meta theory that contains string theory, or or something else. So from string theory. Okay. Yes. Uh, Aaron. Yeah. Yes, Aaron. Hi. So uh, I wanted to uh, be the first to congratulate Joe on his seminal future achievement, uh, even greater than his achievement of classifying all uh, quantum field theories. A uh, rigorous argument showing that string theory is necessarily physically correct <laughs> on the grounds that it is uh, uh, an ingenious, using an ingenious argument that is, in fact, dual to all interesting mathematical structures. <laughs> this, this is 90th or 190th? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what's right. Uh, <laughs> um, we, need, we need more. I, I like the word quantum field theory. And, and so I, I would invite uh, some comments about that. Alvin? Yeah. Um, there's a lot to learn about the structure of high energy quantum states and how to even calculate with them. Good. Let's, yeah, let's have a, a, a Q column or QU column. Yeah. So high energy quantum states. I mean, along the lines of what. Matt was talking about, for example. You mean, uh, as opposed to ground states, you mean? Uh, yeah, as opposed to ground states. So uh, excited states, maybe? Yeah. Highly excited states? Yeah, in all sorts of different systems. OK, good. Other uh, sort of things that, I mean, a lot of stuff involves quantum mechanics, but uh, other quantum-y things, yeah? Uh, I have a prediction for the next 30 years. We'll okay. actually get good enough at quantum manipulation that we can actually make experiments that test our models. Good. Okay. So uh, quantum computation slash simulation? Yeah, quantum simulation. Quantum we'll call it. simulation. I think that we will have quantum systems that can simulate certain Hamiltonians, which is not exactly the same thing. But well, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's close it's enough. Getting that term. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, is. I think, like, I think uh, this is a fruitful line of discussion. Um, do, do you, Matthew, do you have a comment about that? Is there a mic up here? I don't know. If it's, if it's cold atom you know, manipulation. Does that count as a quantum? Yeah. Quantum simulation. I'm, I'm, okay. We're ready. It's starting. And so so it, you think that will be fruitful? That, I think that will be really fruitful. And it may be fruitful to start addressing things like highly excited states, non-equilibrium dynamics, real-time dynamics. So this, is, this might be a tool that uh, interacts I think, with. yeah, because we're so limited with other tools, basically. Okay. That kind of fits with my proposal. So yeah, the general feeling is that uh, it's hard to simulate quantum field theory on a classical computer. It's computationally intensive, right? We need all these mm -hmm. lattice collaborations with supercomputers and so on. So but I think 
there could be uh, ways to to achieve progress on this front. Like, they, so simulating quantum field theory on a, on a classical computer yes. may actually not be as hard <coughs> as, uh, as, as it currently is. So, anyway. so, so the idea would be that there are better ways of using yeah, there classical are computers. Yeah, there are better ways of using classical computers for it. So, uh, new algorithms, new regularization techniques, new, new, uh, new tools. Yeah, new tools. Yeah. For quantum field theory, that's too general, but new computational tools? Yeah. Not, I mean, I don't, I don't mean by that integrability, but... Yeah. Uh, I, I, I yeah. guess I'll second that. I mean, I think we have just beginning to be able to deal with four-dimensional field theories the way we used to deal with two-dimension. And when that becomes cheap, when we can have the exaflop laptop where people can a weekend can try a new uh, four-dimensional field theory, then you will actually be able to... Well, the, the, so that we actually understand a much broader range of quantum field theories which cannot always be uh, mastered by even Joe Polchinski's analytic um, insight. Um, Slava, just to come back to your question, do you mean primarily more computational power tools or new uh, algorithms and new idea tools? No, no, I meant like putting lettuce out of business. <laughs> I, I, that, that gets recorded. <laughs> I'm teaching a course in lattice gauge theory, so putting lattice gauge theory out of business. Okay, good. So Steve yeah, Fred. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so, Steve, you yes. threatened me that uh, with unmentionable things if I didn't say anything. So, um, you can, you can so, the, so, so, <laughs> so in return, I think you should cross out the lost in a black hole because that's just not a viable option for the future. Cross out. It's um, not, we this, we this, meant, this meant intellectual physics, loss. Physics should not get lost in. But should or, or won't? In 30 years, we should not. Okay. But so should, I, but should I, you mean I, it will not happen? It's unlikely to happen. I, I just cross it up. It cannot happen. It's like all the uh, molecules in the room going in the same corner. <laughs> this, the, second, the second part that, is a that confession. That does happen. <laughs> yes. It, yeah. The second, the second point is a, a confession. Um, yes. And Gary, you have to hold your ears for this. But I've always been very scared of Alice and Bob. So I hope that in 30 years, Alice and Bob will have learned string theory so that the discussions become... Of, of black hole information becomes in the framework comes in the framework where quantum gravity naturally lives, which is in string theory. So I, I hope that can be a, a possible way to resolve um, the questions. And I think that okay, goes so, along so with the sign of the fact is that uh, string theory will uh, by what 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 would you like? So to I would like. I mean, it goes with Eva's point that I think the, so, so say, the questions of quantum gravity should theory? be yes, yeah. Okay, so, uh, and, okay. And, and then the, then the final you, point is that this is a But you have to promise that this will be far before 30 years, okay? Well, that, that may be up to others. <laughs> okay. The, the final point is that, that I hope people in the future, in the next 30 years, will not necessarily identify as a string theorist, but as a, as a theorist who addresses interesting problems in physics and uses string theory as a framework when it's useful to do that. Usually. So. Okay, so uh, can't we all just get along? Is that, was that the? There was, my, my uh, sort of uh, poor taste remark, yes, as it usually does, yes. What, say, what, say something that you want to say along those lines. Okay. I think the group is too disparate. I mean, it's, you know, string theory is dual to field theory in some way, possibly. And so, you know, field theory is a. I, yeah. I just think one might want to take a, a broader view of quantum physics, perhaps, the, and, uh, and imagine that the, you know, that the community that's in this room will, then, you know, itself have broadened out and attacking, you know, a larger. Class of problems, and you know, in some sense, that's happening, happening already. But uh, yeah, the universality of 
quantum phenomena, yeah. Okay. And, and implementing that in uh, hiring, conferences, uh, education, et cetera? I saw, uh, Nada, you had your hand. Yes, please. in the last 30 years is that a lot of branches of science, not just physics, come yes. together. Much stronger interaction with mathematics, yes. cross-fertilization between mathematics and physics, and even within physics, ideas from condensed matter, ADS, like ADS-CMT, string theory versus field theory, people moving back and forth between different subjects. This unity of science, I think, is a wonderful thing, and my sense is that this will only get better in the future. And, of course, I second everything that the two last people said. We should do more of that, and we should encourage that. And yeah, I'll stop here. Okay. So I, I think, uh, say, you know, for, for Joe to have a, a birthday, that's a, that's a good time to celebrate that, since he's been a, a symbol of that. So uh, universality of quantum phenomena, cooperation, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, unified uh, versions of unified research. I'm not sure. Those aren't good words, but uh, okay. Yes, Andy. Yeah. So oh, maybe right. this is um, not the kind of comment you want, but but I um, I think it would be I think it would be nice to um, yeah. make some definite list on here. Put this into something definite. And store it for posterity. It is not 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 to guide people five or ten years from now for the vision uh, that that we had at this moment, but as a testimony to how stupid we are, <laughs> and, yes. and 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 how little, how totally incapable we are of seeing into the future more than three months. Yeah, I, I so I, I I you know I wish that we had done this. 30 years ago in 1984. And I think if we had done it 30 years in 1984, we, 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 we would have had a vision, which first of all would have involved many trips to Stockholm, which never happened. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and secondly... Um, How about to Santa Barbara? <laughs> right. We I'll wouldn't have foreseen the wonderful trips to Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and also, um, it would have been a very narrow vision about the continuation of the kind of physics that had happened for the 30 years before that. That is, finding more, one more force, one more particle, fitting them, fitting them together. I don't think that gravity would have been, you know, it was, gravity would have been, yeah, yeah, we could have predicted that David would still be interrupting. No, us. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that that is, that is the one Andy. that is the one thing that's remained constant and very predictable Andy, over 30 years. I'm with David. I'm with David on this. <laughs> but this, uh, uh, but I think it would have been a very narrow vision, and we we wouldn't have ha we wouldn't have you know black holes wouldn't have been in the story, holography wouldn't have been in the story, and in fact I think it would have been a picture which is far far less interesting than what, is, what has happened. Yes, we have not followed the tradition of the previous uh, 30 years of kind of predicting new particles, predicting new, new forces, it's been a new thing, but we've, we, you know, we've set out on a path, I don't think many people in this room doubt that we have set out on, on a path where we are, we don't know where it's gonna end, we can't promise this, but we feel that we've set out on a path that has involved a totally restructuring of the way that we think about space, time, gravity, and the universe that, that you know, is equal to anything that has happened in the history of human thought in the last many thousands of years. And it's, like, totally exhilarating. Okay. And it's okay, more Andy. fun. Th this I has wouldn't been trade Andy. a trip to Stockholm for what's happened mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in, in, in the last 30 years. Okay. Th this and Andy, Andy, Andy. <laughs> Shut up, Steve. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to predict... You know, the interesting stuff, the interesting stuff you, you, you cannot predict, and there is definitely going to be more of it. You Andy, know, there has been you, no time. Andy, you have to now make a prediction. We have listened to you with great, make a prediction that I can write on the board. Make the, the, a prediction. There, there's going to be something 
at, at least as exciting as as what's happened in the last thirty uh, years, if not more so. <laughs> okay. All right. That it's weak, but I'll write it down. Right. Greg, you've been waiting very patiently. Greg, uh, give Greg the mic. All right. So I, I just want to ask two questions. Uh, one is, is very concrete. Will the six-dimensional conformal field theories play an important role Good. in our understanding of nature? That's the first question. And the second is, I didn't articulate it very well yesterday in the panel, cool? but a really important thing that we... Does this go down? Yeah. Keep, I'm listening, Greg. A really important thing that we learned from D-Brains is that... Um, to a string background, as we curr currently understand it, you can associate a uh, category of D-brains. But to a category of D-brains, in a sense, you can only associate a non-commutative geometry. And that brings me to my second question, which is, will non-commutative geometry, as we currently understand it, play an important role in emergent spacetime? Uh, okay, I'm actually not going to follow up on that, surprisingly enough. Um, I was also, like Andy, thinking a little bit about the previous 30 years. Good. And uh, 1954, so my history is not perfect, but... but the 30 right, years before... The 30 years before the 30 years that we're talking about, yeah. right? 1954, perfusion of experimental results in right. particle physics, right. which nobody understood. Right. And some guys named Yang and Mills wrote down a hypothetical framework which nobody paid any attention to whatsoever. Right. And then there was a period of S matrix theory and so on, which was absolutely the wrong direction to go. Well, sorry, I mean, not completely the wrong direction, but... but <laughs> you, 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 you're, uh, you're walking on thin ice. I, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but please continue. <laughs> but anyway, eventually we realized that gauge theory and non-abelian gauge theory was, was really the, the, the way to understand yeah. Uh, what had been going on. So I've, I've been thinking a little bit about what puzzle confronts us with the same uh, depth now where the explanations that we've tried to give are kind of, mm -hmm. th to me, seem a little weak. Now, it's not something I've worked on at all, but the question is dark matter. What is dark matter? Um, I would be surprised if the conventional FRW description of the universe uh, was still valid in 30 years. I what? mean. In, in other words, hmm. so FRW does not really incorporate, it, it only allows for kinds of matter that we know about. Maybe that's not the right way to phrase the, 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 the puzzle, but, uh, but I think we, we're really lacking a fundamental understanding of dark matter. I'm expecting either from astronomy or from a laboratory more right. observations. That, that's a, a good question. In 30 years, we, right. we may be having very interesting discussions about right. Dark I matter collisions in the lab or something. Yeah. I have. Uh, we, we, uh, uh, I've been holding the microphone for a while. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, have you enjoyed it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually have. Uh, uh, Give a microphone uh, to Mike Dime, but go ahead. Yeah, uh, one, one kind of very prosaic but concrete prediction is in 30 years we will have concrete evidence for deviation from the standard model, either in the form of a new particle or some effect which is unambiguously discrepant from, do, from the minimum. Yeah, yeah we, we should tighten that up. I mean, do you, do you mean we'll, we'll know what dark matter is? We'll have no, observed, no, no, uh, just we, there will be either a discovery of a new particle or discovery of some discrepancy from the standard model in some Cross measured cross section or something like that. Okay, well, give give that to Michael Dine and, and we'll let Michael and can, Dine and can, can I just so and one crazier thought, uh, okay. maybe not crazy, but uh, this is not so much about physics, but continuing on the theme of integration of physics, I think there will be much closer integration between operation of human brain and technology. Good. Good. Uh, like uh, good. Just. You know, the way, we, the way we do physics may be uh, very different from, or do theory. Yeah, I actually was trying to coax that out in the last slide. That, I think that's a very important, interesting thing to think about is how we do, will be doing for 30 years from now. Brain, uh, machine, what? Assisted thinking. Yeah, brain. Uh, <laughs> 90 year old 
And, and I guess the, the important question is which way it goes. Do the human beings assist the computers and their or life or the uh, vice versa? But we'll talk about it. Where, where are we? Michael Dine, I, I think you. Yeah. No, I, no, it's my turn. That's not no, your it's turn. it's my no. turn. No, no, wait. So since it's going to be Joe's 90th birthday, I would like to hear his 90th birthday wishes. No. Yes. No. I'm not I interested would like in to that. hear what he wants to see. I'll, I'll think about this for a little bit. Yeah, what? And maybe I'll keep them secret. No, no, no. This is... Uh... Because... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um... Michael Dine, while, yeah. while we're waiting. I was, I was going <laughs> to elaborate. I think Joe would be very happy with the following if it were true. And this is just an elaboration on Igor's comment. In your history, I think one of the frustrations in our field, and it gets in some ways to Andy's comment about how one might have predicted the future, is that on your list, we really have only one example, or well, two examples, I should say, in the last 30 years of new degrees of freedom. In the that experiment. We've discovered, in experiment. And I, would, and I would be open to this, these degrees of freedom, new degrees of freedom being discovered in the search for dark matter, in, uh, in understanding inflation, perhaps, and in accelerators. But I think all of the any any one of these I think would be I think Joe, not to mention the rest of us, some of us may not be functioning as well at that point, would be very excited about and would really be quite revolutionary. Yeah, in a few minutes I mean we probably have like ten more minutes. I think we have to devote a few minutes to actually talking about the machines that will help us there. But let's we'll we'll in five minutes we'll turn to that. this is like, I have to say what this is like, this for me is sort of like inviting a man to have a discussion about what dinner should be served at his funeral. Thank you, everybody. I thought, actually, that, I think these birthday parties have a little of that flavor. I think uh, this is, uh, you know, we learned from Mark Twain, and this is our, uh, where, where are we? There, Michael? Oh, and, I mean, another great mystery that we, we've been able to say nothing about. Will there be any uh, statement uh, from the relation between the physical laws or even any candidate physical law we can think of and uh, consciousness? Uh, okay. Computer-assisted thinking and... That was my birthday wish, but thank you. Good. Well, reductionism isn't an explanation of that, such a phenomenon. But uh, well, an explanation. Yeah. Okay. Good. That, Melanie, I forgive you. That was a. Uh, that was you extracted something very good. Raphael. Uh, yeah, I actually wholeheartedly agree with Andy. Um, uh, even though I, I realize the threat You're of physical <laughs> physical violence. Uh, but but. Um, and so I don't know, you know, I obviously have no idea what's going to be exciting in, in, in more than three months. Um, I, I think that, that uh, just to bring this a little bit back to Joe, um, there are perhaps two pieces of work that he did uh, or, or was, was involved in that are more controversial or were met with far more resistance than others. Um, I would say that's the, the, the proposal for the cosmological constant problem and the landscape of string theory and firewalls. And while I have no idea whether we'll make very significant progress on settling either of those issues, um, I think in both cases, uh, if we haven't settled them in 30 years, we should still not be able to sleep at night. Uh, another birthday wish. I'd point out both of those have the common element that, that I did them in collaboration with some young firebrand who, who wouldn't let me write a paper that kind of hid the interesting result, but insisted that we declare this. And so I'd like to hope, I, I wish that for the next 30 years, these, these bright and, and fiery young people uh, continue to pass through the KITP and, and, and do this with me. I thought you were going to say that you hope that some young firebrand makes them suffer the way you suffer. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that can be a, my addendum to your uh, request. Um, I think, though, well, Raphael, is that all you want to say, or is that uh, just that? So if we don't uh, understand... I guess one thing I wanted to say was that 
I think there's a big difference between the two, though, in that yeah. uh, in, in one case in the landscape, we can at least have more and more pieces of evidence that will point us one way or another. Are there a l very large number of vacuo or not? Um, in the case of, of firewalls, uh, I don't foresee any, any obvious progress in the near future. But for, for the landscape, one could hope to get so, some information so out, of, out of, say, discovering uh, dark matter in one form or another, seeing an axion or seeing a wimp. Uh, for, 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 for firewalls, uh, I, I don't even have a fantasy of, of how to get signposts. We take a trip to a black hole for the 90th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. Okay. That's good. Organized by the KITC. <laughs> um, other comments? This is probably sort of contained in various things that people have said. But yes. One, one question is whether there's a new language to talk about quantum field theories that, that we haven't sort of yet discovered. And there are many hints that various people have discussed even here. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's really good. Like, let's, what is quantum field theory? Or if I can, you know. And maybe more explicitly, I think this is something that's been implicit in, in several of the remarks. Will we be able to make substantial progress in classifying quantum field theory? Uh, will the bootstrap allow us to solve all few degree of freedom quantum field theories in four dimensions or, or not? Uh, yes? Uh, I hope we can have a 100 TV proton-proton collider and the revolution of the collider technique. Good. You know what? This is exactly the time to turn to that. Yeah. All right. You know, to fulfill at least some of these wishes, it's interesting it's only one panel out of six, but we are going to need new machines, new technology, and they're not going to happen by themselves. So I think we, we should talk about what kind of scenarios exist for us, uh, for our community and the world community to... Uh, Get close to that if they can, if we can. And so I wanted to hear from uh, people that, that know more about that than certainly than I do. Did you have something you want to say? Well, yeah, it doesn't have to do exactly with high energy machines, but it has to do with the fact that enormous amounts of progress are being made in our ability to manipulate small things, to okay. manipulate quantum systems. Uh, all kinds of things from uh, cold atom traps and uh, that sort of thing. And the ability to manipulate quantum things, I think, is probably going to influence how we think about quantum mechanics. It already is. Uh, entanglement uh, has uh, emerged as a major subject, partly because of uh, the interest of experimenters in trying to build entanglement. But uh, just the ability to manipulate small things, I think, is going to influence physics a lot. Let me give you two examples. Um, the uh, Ion, not uh, heavy atom um, interferometry. Cold atom. Cold, uh, excuse me, cold atom interferometry. Atom. Cold atom interferometry may just uh, be the route to uh, gravitational wave detectors. Uh, I'm now speaking about ideas that, uh, not of mine, of course, but do come out of Stanford, come, do come out of Peter Graham. Uh, the ability to do very high precision tabletop electro, uh, electric dipole moment experiments. Mm -hmm. Uh, might just wind up being axion detectors by observing the oscillating uh, dipole moments of axions and so forth. So I would keep an eye, I really would keep an eye on all of the things that are coming out of our ability to manipulate small things. Right, so one, I, mean, I don't know if you call it the precision frontier, to use a... Well, I, I would like to call it the manipulating small things uh, idea. <laughs> Uh, so we need we need now to talk about machines. So no more comments if learn unless they're about machines. I think the ability to deal with huge amounts of data so you can get very rare events, you know, look extremely carefully at, at things that happen only once in a million, a billion, a trillion things, I think that's a real frontier and that's also very important for accelerators. All right, so now I'm gonna turn either Michael Dine or Eliezer, David, I hope you'll chime in. Or if you're too grumpy, don't. Uh, okay, yeah. I think the, what, what will happen, let's say, in the, in the future, yeah. part of it is already dictated, we just don't know about it, and that is what's, what is available there in nature. 
And for this, you said we need uh, machines. Lenny hopes one will get it from manipulating small stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think a more straightforward, uh, maybe more clumsy way is manipulating big stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think the sequence of events, of course, will depend on discoveries. So some part is already, like, some part of the path is already paved. Mm -hmm. The LHC is going to run in the next few years. By now, it knows 2% of the data available to it if it acts to its optimal. And if we get the other 98% at a higher energy and find something new, I think this will clearly have an enormous influence on how the next years are going uh, to be. And uh, if not, it's also going to have an enormous impact, which is now coupled, unfortunately, to social financial issues and less to science. If the scientists succeed to convince uh, funding agencies to go and just discover things and not promise win-win situations, because this may end up not being a win-win situation, but if the scientists are powerful enough to convince governments to invest in just discovery and not what is already known to be discovered, this is going to have a large impact, and if not, then our future depends on who is now 20 years old and whatever they are going to do in the next 30 years. What are the odds that there will be a 100 TV accelerator running at Joe's 90th birthday? I think it's not impossible. I don't think it's impossible. Uh, I don't think, I'm not sure if I'll be there so I can make any prediction. Uh, you can make a prediction. Safely, I can safely make a prediction. But maybe by making a competition, uh, maybe that will succeed somehow. Trying to have a multipolar world, uh, also in experimental science, maybe also the US returning to play uh, some role in that, maybe will enable us to reach that within a, a several decades. I don't know if 30, 40, or 25. Uh, pass it to the person on your right. Okay, sorry to cut in here. I have just been told that we have a shuttle cutoff, so perhaps one more uh, profound comment. And then I'm uh, gonna make two closing remarks. Okay, so okay yeah, we here, I'll, have to. I'll go for, for profundity, which is actually just echoing things that have been said. So okay. I think a, a fair wish list is 100 TEV machine. I think another fair list is where wish list is Lenny's comment. I think axions is a, are a plausible, very plausible form of dark matter, and they're, and I would not bet high odds that we're going to find them in ADMX. I think we're going to need the kinds of things that Lenny was alluding to uh, to get to lighter axions. And I would leave one thing open where I don't have a clue, and I don't think anybody does. But this was my remark about degrees of freedom connected with inflation. I don't, you know, we know a lot about inflation. We don't have a real clue how we might distinguish really models of inflation or pictures of inflation. And that's an area where I could imagine in some way we would make progress over these next 30 years, both theoretically and experimentally. Good. Okay, so I, I hope we can give Joe data from this machine at its 90th birthday. Okay, so that we have to close off. I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to make two remarks. If I were asked this question, I wouldn't have taken Andy's out. I would have said, we'll be puzzled about classifying quantum field theories, and we'll be, still be puzzled about eternal inflation, the most puzzling thing I've ever thought about. But the thing I actually paid the most attention to in putting together this thing was this final slide about developments in information technology and the kind of questions that Igor was getting at how our relationship to knowledge and the way we do physics will change. And there I was very conservative. The first thing I came up with, I think in 30 years, there will be no tech. <laughs> Not much less, maybe, yeah, much less probable, although I think it's true, is no typing. Although it's hard, this, this may be wrong. <laughs> Maybe direct neural input, maybe speech. And, and, and the last, well, Fortran's an example. And the, the last thing I would say is that I think many, if not most, conferences will be in the cloud, a combination of advanced video conferencing, telepresence, and so on. I hope you're wrong. No. Right. Let me finish. Some conferences, though, well, it'll be indispensable to have face-to-face -face contact, meet friends, start those interactions, and one of them for sure will be Joe's 90th birthday, okay? 
and all of us will look forward to being here in person 90 years from now. Not 30 years from now. So, thank you. Happy birthday, Joe. Okay. So I, uh, I knew there was uh, no way to follow that. Uh, I will uh, just say happy birthday to Joe. Uh, there are two very important thank yous, though, uh, to uh, be conveyed. First, uh, the organizers asked me to really emphasize that uh, everyone who came uh, should be thanked, especially those who uh, came and uh, were kind enough to uh, speak. Uh, so let's have a round of applause for everyone. And then, of course, uh, thank you very much to uh, Don and Eva for organizing such a great event. Uh, they clearly deserve a uh, solid round of applause. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we did that. But thanks again to the, uh, to the great staff. That is it.